Welcome to the Hunting Beast Report, a live video podcast with Dan Infault and host Jeremy Gillespie. Today's podcast is brought to you by Stealth Outdoors. The off season is a great time to rehab your gear, so head on over to Stealth Outdoors at www.stealthoutdoors.com to pick up some climbing stick wraps, cam buckle covers, platform cable wraps, or stealth strip rolls for all of your miscellaneous silencing needs. Today's show is also made possible by Hunting Beast Gear, innovators in mobile hunting gear and the designers of the Beast Sticks and Beast Stand. Check out the latest products at www.huntingbeastgear.com. And now, on to the podcast. All right, today we're live with Dan Infault and very special guest, Mr. Jared Scheffler. Jared, how are you doing today? Good, good. Thank you guys for having me on. Never been on, never been on yours, but <laughs> both both Dan and I, we're we've co- we've conversed some over the years, and, and we're both kind of like I think co- quiet with the uh, the so you know that everything, and so yeah. yeah. I think a lot of the audience will be familiar with you, but if not, we're going to give you a chance to do an intro. But real quick before we okay. do that, uh, show sponsors Stealth Outdoors tomorrow, April tenth. They're going to have a flash sale twenty four. 24 hours only they're gonna have 25 percent off the new beast gear stealth plaid collection so the jackets um stealth strips are going to come in that same plaid pattern that's new those are going to be on sale also and then the smoke camo garment so if you're looking to pick up some gear from stealth outdoors tomorrow one day only april 10th check out the flash sale so jared like i said people that aren't already familiar with you i imagine most of dan's audience is but give us like a two-minute intro who you are what you do and how you got to where you're at today and if I sneeze, I just about had one coming on a second ago. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like I almost got it. So anyways, uh, yeah, no, I, I Jared Scheffler from Whitetail Adrenaline. Um, been producing the Whitetail Adrenaline video series. Uh, 14 seasons are out. Been doing it 17 years. Um, it uh, started with the first video being by permission and public and then my cousin Jim and I, he he was there in the beginning and he's still there. He just has only done like one hunt a year. And he so he didn't make it on the new uncuff, but uh, he'll be back. Um, but uh, anyways, then we launched the all public series for what? 12 seasons after that. So season two through 13. And then the new uncuffed is mainly public, but some door knocking in there too. And so, uh, yeah, it's kind of a, an aggressive style. It is what it is format it shows the highs the lows the mistakes the screw-ups the misses the i uh every every deer i've missed and hit and not recovered as i've shown it the way it is and and uh fortunately i think there's been only three in all that time but uh knock on wood right (laughs) yeah yeah don't go jinxing yourself now yeah 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 two two i'm certain made it uh the third one he was he was you know, I still seen him a couple of weeks later, but, uh, you know, anything could happen, you know? Yeah. Well, one more quick note, admin note, uh, before we got started, Dan's speakers decided to go out. So Dan's calling in via phone. So if Dan's audio is a little weird today, that's why. And, uh, Dan's going to get some new speakers for next week. So Dan sounds a little tunnely today. That's why, uh, Jared. So I want to start out talking about the importance of experience and how it hones your instincts over time. I saw in another interview, you did that you said basically there's no replacement for experience or time in the field. So um, I think in the era of social media, a lot of guys get on, they watch Dan's videos, they watch your videos and and all they see is the highlights and the success. Well, you do show when, when you miss and things go wrong, um, but it still comes across like that's a snippet, right? That's a minute yeah. of the video. So maybe talk yeah. about how long you've been doing this and how your instincts have been uh, honed from all of that experience over time and, and maybe give people that are newer out there some some hope that that's going to come with time. Yeah, I, I well, I would say this first off, there's still honing. Now there's every season, there's still mistakes that get made and it's just, that's, it's good. It's humbling. Uh, but um, I, I do believe that that is true, that there is no replacement for experience. And then if you combine that with a realistic, like, where did I go wrong? Where did I screw up? Where did I make a mistake? that kind of programs that deeper mind well what i call the other mind which is your instincts that's kind of what i refer to it as so you use your conscience to dissect what went wrong and then over time you haven't pathologized 
bad habit or bad mis- and and you're not as likely to repeat them. Not saying it can't happen or you end up in a scenario, but that's why if you do a really good job of cross evaluating what went wrong or you know what happened there, I think over time that's what hones those instincts, you know, and makes them more and more precise and 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 then you can really operate on like a feel basis more with with good results. Maybe in the beginning maybe not so much. That's where it's like really like you're consciously wrapping your mind around every little detail, but eventually you cross a threshold where you can begin to trust that more. And I think it gets more accurate, your decision-making going off the instinct. We've seen it many times as we've gotten older and more experienced, you second guess what your instinct's telling you to do and you use the conscience to override it and then you end up (coughs) paying for not you know it doesn't end you know end up uh well there uh and, and not always but but we've seen that many times um so that's kind of what that um kind of what that maybe that doesn't explain it the best but I, I think that's the reason why um and i was fortunate my to to get a pretty good my dad didn't break it down like that but my dad very much looking back on it he very much had that very adaptable. I never actually seen my dad use a tree stand. We'd go out to the woods. He'd be like, you think you can shimmy up that tree? And you'd have like two, three tree pegs in your pocket, <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, that's it. That's, that's it. Uh, you think you can, you know, get in that crotch of that tree. That's how I shot my first buck. It was a, a really tight crotch. I could only stand in one leg. I had to cross my other leg and, uh, you know, put the other foot on the other foot. It was a tight wedge, but, you know, I, my max range with that bow back then was 15, 20 yards probably. And so it's like, I need to be in that tree, he said. And so, but my dad had that very adaptable and, and he came in very, you know, over years, he got very experienced and and had killed a a lot of bucks. And so I think I adopted a, a good foundation kind of back then when I look back on it. Um, and I did kind of, you know, go my own kind of, you know, different direction for a period of time, uh, before I started the videos, but I ended up kind of breaking from, from that. And, you know, it was still adaptable, but I tried a lot more of, I don't want to say necessarily mainstream techniques, but a lot of things that would maybe work really good on private land. I, and I just found that I, it didn't work as well for certain types of settings, I guess. So I got a little long there. <laughs> no, that's good. That's, uh, that's what people are here for is to listen to you speak. So Dan, Dan uh, what about you? You talk about confidence all the time and anything that Jared said there that resonates with you. Uh, I just keep thinking to myself, uh, about all these stocks he does, um, as far as confidence, I mean, I mean, uh, I didn't catch anything in there that uh, surprised me. Uh, I just uh, the whole time you was talking about that, my head's spinning about all these uh, stocks he does because I fail at them all the time. That's where Jared has me really beat because uh, <laughs> every time I try that, I see flags flying and deer running. And, uh, that has it, to be, uh, it's harder. Uh, to, it's I, harder I to do with the stomps. <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's true. I don't hunt as much open terrain as you do. That's, that's yes. really a fact. But I, when I go to the open terrain, I find myself trying to spot a deer, see where it's going, and get in front of it because I I really lack that confidence because the few times I've tried it, I've failed miserably. I mean, it just seems sure. so in tune. You know, yeah. um, maybe you can give us some insight on that. And you know, that's mainly uh, what you do nowadays. Dan, is a lot of stalking. Yeah. And stalking. Yeah, Could yeah. Go into that a little bit for anybody that hasn't watched your videos. Yeah, um, almost all the ones I think I've killed with with a bow have been a spot in stock. There's, uh, I'd have to think on the videos on the video series. Um, I, there might be a you know one or two or something where I was on the ground, not engaged in a stock. Uh, I just. I'm not recalling. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, a uh, big one that I killed in defiance. Well, I made a bad hit and then got him. I did spot that deer. He was on private. I got right on the edge where, or Chancy and I did. Chancy filmed it. 
And we did have to wait for that deer, try to predict where he might cross, if he would cross. And as luck would have it, he did cross there. So I guess that one rings a bell. Um, you know, but most of the ones, stalking is what I prefer is to get a visual and, and then kind of, because it's in, you're engineering a new plan on every situation. It's like, okay, what's, and sometimes you don't have much time to like run all the, the, you know, run everything that needs to, you know, engineer that plan of how you're going to get it done. Sometimes you don't have much time. Sometimes you do have a lot of time, but it's a new, new setting and with new variables every single time. And, and that's one thing. And I think what got me hooked on stalking when I look back on it is in Wisconsin, when I grew up, you couldn't actually start hunting until you were 12 with, you know, you could, you could assist in like say deer drives and, and stuff like that, as long as you were wearing orange, but you could not actually fire a what, you know, you, you couldn't get a license. You couldn't, you couldn't hunt until you were 12. And so mm -hmm. I grew up in, you know, on a small dairy farm and uh, got five brothers and sisters and, you know, hunting is big in my family <laughs> and my dad, that's, you know, that's a very, you know, there's chore life, farm life, some fish in life and hunting, hunting was something that, that really got ingrained in all of us. And deer drives was something that, I mean, that's what I grew up with, but I couldn't actually carry a gun till I was 12. So I would go, you know, in the cornfields or whatever as a driver and I'd peek down the rows and then I'd like, okay, I'm going to get, I can't, I can't, you know, shoot them, but I'm going to see how close I can get. So I kind of, I kind of love that cat and mouse, you know, I never did touch one, but I was, I was pretty small and squirm, you know, I got very close once. <laughs> on a doe and i think i kind of got hooked on that hole and you know around the farm there's always these starlings which are the smartest bird at least in wisconsin that you know dad want to gone off the farm and they, they're super smart witty birds so i got really honed on like sneaking up on them and i think i got you know because they don't let you get real close at, at least not on that farm that you know on our farm they didn't but you know and all these other birds and, and things um so uh, anyways, um, I think I got a lot of that, you know, that stalking, uh, and, and if anybody watches the videos, they see me screw up every year, still make mistakes. I mean, on the new uncuff, there's a couple of, couple of flashbacks I did and some, some, some in there, you know, I mean, I've been fortunate, uh, you know, the last couple years uncuffed was filmed in 2020, but to, to come in and, and you know, I, uh, I felt like I was really on point and, uh, that's another thing too, uh, because I'm behind the computer editing so much and whether it's myself or somebody else, I get to really pick every stock and situation apart. And, and so it's like, I'm coming into the season, even if I didn't get much hunting in for the last year, the year before or whatever, I'm coming in pretty well oiled <laughs> because I've been sitting behind a computer you know, I think there is an effect there too that that keeps me, you know, pretty well oiled when the season starts. Well, Jared, we want to talk about your your bread and butter, which is stocking, and I think a lot of people associate you, or at least I do, with uh, lockdown rut tactics in you know Kansas things like that. But let's real quick, let's talk about early season. And I know you guys have had some early season hunts like North Dakota and stuff. How does your playbook change in the early season, if at all? And what advice would you give people that are trying to employ your style during the early season? During the early season, one of the differences is during the rut, we don't usually like to give them much time once we got them bedded. It's just too many things can go wrong. There's a lot of different hunters out there, pheasant hunters, you know, bird hunt, you know, whatever. There's other deer hunters, other bow hunters you know, and then obviously you got the rut. So if you got a buck locked down with a doe, it could just take a satellite buck moving in there and pissing off, you know, and then they go running off and pretty soon they're on private or they're, <clears throat> or they just relocated. And then you got to find them back because sometimes you might've lost your, you know, from a vantage point, it's like, okay, there they are, but now you got to move in. And maybe they were a half out a mile out when you spotted them. And then you, you didn't get in there fast enough and you lost your visual while you're doing it. And then that's like, where, well, where'd they go? 
<laughs> you know, uh, so there's a lot that can go. Whereas early season, you know, every situation is different. So I don't think there's a really a one size fits all. There's different relative factors that come in. But if if we're hunting in a in a area or a or a pocket where it doesn't feel like there's any hunting pressure, and we get a visual on a big buck early in the morning or something, and the winds aren't very strong and the conditions aren't quite right to, to, to move in. We might let that deer sit that I, I killed one a couple of years ago where I, we did, we did just that, uh, got a visual just for a second. I, I had spotted the deer or Tanner had the night before at, I don't know, it was about a mile and a half out, knew it was a big one. And he didn't expose himself till right at last light. We figured he probably was bedding very close to there, just the way he kind of just was operating. He he kind of, you know, just, yeah, it's, there's a lot of things like sense wise. It's like pretty sure he was bedding pretty close there. Caught him the next morning, I believe, or we believe it was the same buck. And there was really only one spot we could vantage to watch it from, which was about a mile and a half. And in that particular case, he went over this ridge, only got a glimpse of him. I don't even think Tanner really got to see him. And we didn't get a clip of the deer before he got over the ridge. And the conditions weren't right. Like there wasn't wind, enough wind. We lost our vision. We couldn't get it by driving around, you know, just with the train and everything. There was no way to really. So I looked at the conditions and seen that, you know, stronger winds are going to pick up early afternoon. So, I mean, shouldn't do this and normally we'd, we we would stay just in location even for hours trying to get a revisual i didn't figure we were going to get a revisual so we kind of went and screwed off went back to camp ate breakfast flung some arrows for a little bit had some fun the winds picked up and uh ethan filmed that on, with me and we went in there without a visual but found him i didn't find him till i was seven yards from him <laughs> um but uh it came together. It was like probably my most flawless. Like you always have these situations where even these stocks where it's like everything comes together at the end. But man, you, I, I almost, you know, there's multiple times where it's like I made a mistake there. But, you know, uh, I, I was very um, on point on that. And I thought that's kind of I think around the era where I was like, you know, I've been editing so much. And, and had so much, you know, that I think, I, I think I just came in because Tanner caught it. He's like, how, how, like I'm rusty out of the gate and, and he hunts a ton. And, and I was like, well, I, I think it's probably because I'm spending so much time behind the computer and, and picking things apart. I came in, you know, fairly well oiled on that one. So that one came together smooth. So I got that again, got long. Um, but we've done that early season multiple times where get the, vi got the visual. It doesn't appear to be much pressure. The winds aren't very strong. They're in a, you know, they're in the grass or whatever. This one wasn't in the grass, but it was in a situation where it would have been now looking back on it too, where he got bedded would have been very dangerous for me. Wind current wise. I really, even at seven yards, as soon as I pop, popped him i quickly got back up four yards to ethan just to get the scent keep blowing it over the ridge because it was right at that threshold and it was one of those winds that is coming in and out and in and out and then and then i i you know that's another thing over years i just kind of realized like in that situation instincts kicked in i got to get the hell up to ethan to keep that scent going then when we feel those gusts coming in like they're blowing in strong. We got to get down there real quick and make it happen before the wind settles down for 10 seconds and sucks the current down. And, and, and that's just an instinct thing you learn over time in, you know, in that. And, and it came together very well. I don't think the deer ever knew we were there. Uh, there's no sign that it ever did. So, um, but uh, shot that one in the bed. Um, but, um, but yeah, we've done that many times on early season hunts. Got that visual earlier in the morning, you know, and it might be, it, it's, it's, you know, sometime in the morning, but the winds aren't right when we wait for it, you know, and, and there's a lot of factors, you know, I learned something from Tanner. I was like, I can't believe I missed that one for so long um, where, you know, he, he, he described a situation. I think this was two years ago. It was drizzly. He had the visual, it was raining or, or something and he hung out at 50 60 yards waited just until that 
rain was going to stop, then quickly close the distance. And because he knew that deer was going to stand within probably a half hour tops because it had been raining for hours. And I was like, I can't believe I missed that one for so many years. Like, cause I'm trying to get in tight inside of 20 with a longbow. And that's where you really get screwed when you can't make it happen quick because you're, 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 you're inside of 20 yards on a big buck. Yeah. And you're going to hang out there for two, three hours and think he's not going to catch a wind current. That's, that's very yeah. difficult to do, you know? No. And in, in your wind and your approach, that's a good segue to something that I've heard you talk about, and this would be familiar to the hunting beast, but I'd be curious on your take on how to apply it on a stock. And that's just off winds. Dan talks a lot about hunting points and swamps where, you know, the wind's blowing down the point, but not exactly. It's just off the point where you expect the deer bedded. And I think that's something you guys employ a lot with your stock. So maybe yeah. talk about, you've got a visual on a buck and you know how you're going to approach that with the wind because you guys do use that just off wind a lot is that correct that is very correct and uh that one gets us quite often too but a lot of times it's the only way we can do it and get it filmed and um and the one thing is is it gets very dangerous as i've come to find out over the years the closer you get that margin, you know, you're, you might be keeping that scent right off, but when you're at 40 yards, it ain't as dangerous as when you're at 15. I mean, now, now it only takes a, a, a slight shift in that wind for just a split second. And it's, it's like, it's getting to them right now. Um, and, and uh, I, I have kind of developed a new approach to that, which, uh, won't really be seen too much in the next video, but the one that follows where I, I, I really don't waste any time anymore once I'm, I'm breaking a certain distance on those animals because you, you, you just, I've just learned over the time you get, okay, I want to get inside of 20 and you know, I can't get a shot where they're at right there, but I'm going to hang out there at 20 and I, I, I just, they're going to get me by wind current, some him or the doe or, or maybe there's a satellite buck around or something stupid's going to happen. So that, um, that resonates with me pretty heavy because, you know, even out of a tree stand, I've learned that when, when you're dealing with, you know, pressured buck, uh, when they're mature, when they get within 20 yards, I want to get that arrow in as fast as I freaking can because they are so adept at catching you. Just anything. And, you know, so I, I resonate yeah. with that a lot. Even though you're on the ground, I'm in a tree. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, 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 I get that. And sometimes I think about it and I can't believe it didn't hit me sooner. That's one that I aired out on for a while. Like, you know, back when I used to play more of the tree stand games, it's like something I knew, like once they break in close, you don't have much time. My dad taught ingrained that in me too. Like, like don't, don't screw around too much. But then I've made that mistake trying to get in tight with a longbow 20 yards to get that, you know, and then it's like, I stupidly sometimes have thought I'm going to hang out there for an hour. And I felt like an idiot after doing it enough times. Like it, it's, it's very difficult to do. Um, so, uh, so yeah, you're right on with that. Um, which, which, yeah, you got a, ton of experience with hello dan well i think we lost dan for a minute i'm gonna try to call oh, him back what's going on yeah oh, no, yeah i think that's what happened so we'll okay, see yeah you guys were looking at it i it kind of threw me off a little bit i was like yeah was, so, well, sorry about well, that i'll call him oh, back in a second here but um you talked something there that uh you, you kind of stole my question which was how often are you trying to get within like your 20 yard longbow range versus what i would call like zone of proximity with 60 80 yards or whatever and then like letting the deer come to you and how does that plan change like during a lockdown phase if there's a satellite buck around it's all it's it's really situational usually i don't hang out uh back at 60 80 but you know there have been a few situations at times where it's like the only option um whether they're just across the line on private or there's too many satellite bucks or, you know, there's certain scenarios that, that, that does happen. But usually I like to try to get in, in tight on them and just kind of make it 
hopefully come. I've just found too. It's like I hang out at 60, 80. Well, I can't make that shot like I could with a compound or, right. or, right. High, or probability of making it with a, with a, with a compound. And so it just, it just gets risky. I I've just found for me, it, it just gets riskier to, to, to set up like that. Um, so when you, gets, when you get I, close, the first good opportunity you have, you're, you're moving in for the yeah. kill then. Yeah. Yeah. And that's also, I mean, that's also, uh, I don't need to get into broadheads, but that's one, one reason I don't screw around when it comes to that. Cause it's like that shot angle presents itself. I need it to go right through whatever direction. And my favorites are head on and quarter and two, as long as you can punch it through, um, on ground zero level. Um, so, uh, kind of like Dan was saying earlier in the tree stand, I want to get that arrow in them. Once he breaks 20, I want to get it in him as fast as possible because, you know, it's it's like as soon as those mature bucks, uh, and I'm sure Dan will back me up on this, that once they reach that age, it's the same thing that we were talking about earlier with the human mind. Their instincts get so programmed, and in, in a snap second, they know something's up and they're out of there. Yeah. You know? They're not, yeah. they're not hanging out like a two or a three year old will at times or often. And like by gives you a second or two or five seconds, you know, those, you know. Yeah. When you're that close, they don't hang around to find out. They just run usually. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't know it's coming almost yeah. as fast as it happens, you know. So. Let's see if we got Dan back. Dan, can you hear us? Yeah. I can hear you now. Okay. How did what happened? We got disconnected. Sorry, uh, yeah. I, my internet's going in and out. Okay. Sorry. So, uh, Jared, you mentioned some things there, Dan, we were, we were talking about when you get close, do you push the envelope or do you kind of hang out waiting for an opportunity? And, and Jared said, typically he likes to push the envelope and the first good opportunity he has to get in and make the kill. makes the kill. And Jared, you mentioned there, um, quartering two and frontal shots. And I think that's the thing, you know, growing up hunter safety and stuff, a lot of people shy away from that, but from the ground, that's a deadly shot. So give people some perspective on like when you started taking those shots, what's maybe the max range you would take that shot, where exactly on the deer are you aiming on that shot? So, you know, fill us in on, on your experiences over the years with frontal and courting two shots from the ground. Okay. Well, the first time was an accident and that's on video on regroup. Uh, and that was with Scott's bow. Uh, the first five years I used one of the other guys as compounds um, which is a whole nother story, but he had it set up that year and he was running expandable broadheads at that time. It was accidental. I was waiting. The buck had us pegged. Didn't know what we kind of were because we were blended into the cedar tree a bit on the ground. We heard him up ahead. We went tiptoeing in and didn't know what, it, what exactly it was. And there was three bucks, two younger ones, and then this, this pretty good uh, eight pointer. And he come right up the pipe like he'd kind of want him, but he caught us and was like, what, what the heck is it? He could, just couldn't quite make out what it was. And I was already at full draw and I didn't feel good on the shot because it was a head on or may, mainly head on. Sure. And I had never taken that shot. Just heard all the stories over the years, you know, about the, not taking that shot. And I was at full draw for, for, a, a decent amount of time and because he was still trying to figure out what the heck that is he knew something wasn't right as far as visually that's the difference between uh, with a nose they know what the hell you are you know in this particular yep. case he was just trying to get confirmation is this is this what i think it might be uh but my finger came off the trigger of the of the release for a split second and i went to get it back on and i bumped it just a little too much and i had the pin right there and so it hit that deer right there and even though it was an expandable head and it didn't get that great of an, a penetration <sighs> that, it ended up being a very quick you know i mean the deer ran to his death and it was a walking blood trail and i was all concerned about it on video you know at first and and i didn't at that time i hadn't seen the you know the he got into the cedars real quick so I, I didn't see that what a devastating effect it had on him until we got on the blood trail and walked up. And I was like, I'm going to have to rethink this just a little bit. And, uh, and so um, from that point on, we started kind of, you know, in situations taking that shot and it uh, to this day, we haven't lost one yet on a head on shot. Um so, Did you see that giant that I shot? Uh, 
not this last season, but the season before, early season? I, I believe I believe you. I don't know if you sent me a pick or somebody sent it to me. Oh, is that how you got him right down the putt, right down the hatchet? I didn't get him. It yeah. didn't. The shot was the shot was perfect, but uh, I had a shoulder problem and I got my bow turned down to fifty pounds. But it was a, uh, it was a fixed head. I got about a foot of penetration, but the shot looked perfect right underneath his chin, looking up at me. Yeah, but it was only shot because he came in, he looked up in the tree at me, and he was about to pull, and I was already a full draw. Yeah, and I, I figured at six yards, right down his throat, and it looked like the arrow went perfect. I got like twelve inches of uh, penetration, had a lot of blood, and some of it was obviously lung blood. So I must have went to one side or the other. Uh huh. And uh, I tracked it across three properties and, and lost it. Wow. Yeah. And, and so when you're aiming at a deer on a frontal shot, Jared, let, let's say. Let's take uh, let's cut the head off the deer, right? We're just looking at the the body from straight on. If you cut the head off, you don't even have to shoot it. It's already yeah. dead. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you aiming center or lower third? I mean, I'm I'm assuming you're not aiming upper third ever. It, you know, it 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 really depends on you know as far as I'm gonna put scenario into the compound. You know, like into that situation for compound shooters because it's a little different with a with a with a longbow. Like you just kind of you just kind of process things just a little bit differently, or at least I do. Um, but with a compound, that's going to vary depending on like, okay, does he have you pegged? What's his intensity level? What's his distance? How, you know, how fast is, you know, your, your, you know, bow, you know, as far as what you're, what you're set up with, which I've, that's an, that's another one that I, I don't, I used to get really caught up on precision accuracy and I, I don't want to degrade, you know, archers from getting too focused on precision accuracy, but I did hit one in, in that video in 2010. And I'd seen this happen, this, you know, the deer reacting and dropping enough over the years on video. I had filmed before the, the you know, the video series too, but I had seen it enough to where I actually started tracking like how much they move, you know, with, okay, how much they move in relation to, that arrow you know as it's coming in out of a 70 pound compound and i was just like i i can't I, you know this was a buck that was 26 yards broadside he didn't even start reacting until i figured the arrow i timed it you, you know you can go frame by frame as arrows you know the shot the the video angles right over so you know the frame it's leaving the bow the frame it's hitting the deer and i went frame by frame and i'm like arrow had to be pushing 15 yards out of the bow before he even started the reaction, he got 10 inch, you know, easily 10 inches a drop. And I'm like, I did the math and I'm like, you know, they can drop up to two inches per 10 feet of arrow travel out of a 70 pound compound, you know, and that was just a full metal jacket with a hundred grain, you know, head, you know, it wasn't anything radically heavy. Like it's like, it was super slow. And I was just like, that drove me nuts. And it just kind of, I had to kind of come to grips with that because I had gotten so, I I used to work in an archery shop a long time ago when I was 17. I got really fine-tuned on accuracy, shot hinge releases the whole, you know, the whole nine yards, shot my first mature buck at 52 yards to the heart. Precision accuracy worked great there. But as I went on a little bit further and got more aggressive with these animals and different things, I started to see things where I'm like, if I keep putting eggs too much in that basket, I'm going to keep getting the same result because I can't predict. And, and I mean, on the, the latest video, Tanner had one at 34 yards, which is a very dangerous yardage to shoot, you know, and try to predict how much they're going to react, especially when they peg, when they pegged, you know, this buck pegged them, both him and the guy, you know, Ethan Filman in broad daylight, they're in the wide open. He's got a knock and arrow, get it drawn. And I don't know what this buck's deal was, why he gave him, you know, rut, you know, he's all rutted up, but, um, he sent the arrow and, and the buck never even really flinched. He let it hit him. You know, I mean, maybe, maybe got an inch, but that's, you know, at that yardage, they can easily get 14 inches of drop easy at 34 yards after they got you pegged. And, and I'm just like, how do you, how are you ever going to fully predict that reaction? And so I kind of like good grouping. That's, that's, that's great because then you're, you, you know, that's, one thing 
that I'm like, okay, as long as you're grouping good, you're not sending flyers, I'm not too concerned, which is why I'm not too concerned with fixed blade broadheads. If you just spend just a little bit of time, there's plenty of videos out there that can kind of really teach people, you know, and I, 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 believe in there i don't believe there's a one size fits all best for every archer or every bow hunter or every situation which is why you have an industry it's because this one makes this that works really good in this situation and this one makes this and or a broad range of different you know things um you know if i'm good if i would go hunt really big game like a moose or something, I'm going to use an inch and an eighth cut one blade head. If I'm going to shoot a, a highly reactive whitetail, I'm going to drive the biggest head I can. That's a cut on contact through them uh, to, to punch out the other side. As long as I got the arrow force, because they're so highly reactive, even though they're a smaller animal, a lot more can go wrong. And, and I'm getting kind of, you know, a little bit maybe sidetracked from the original, but I just, you know, I kind of learned I had to give up that, that really so focused on precision accuracy. And that's really kind of made it an easy transition for me to a longbow, you know, and knock on wood, I've been blessed to only lose one with a longbow. I've clean missed a lot, but, you know, and I've been fortunate to kill, you know, a decent, decent amount, but I, I've only lost one. And I, I just hit that one high just is is and not that high but it, it that one was like three bow lengths away you know for, like <laughs> this it was right in my you know i mean you can't get them any closer in the wheelhouse hardly so i mean uh you know i just i got talking on some things there but i uh and two in those high intensity situations i i don't want any anxiety when it comes to up that that's in the way or, you know, that I don't want to, you know, it's like, you ain't got much time and things can go wrong real quick. And I don't want any anxiety and what the hell I'm sending. Um, so that's why I'm pretty particular over the years on, on certain things there. And I've noticed that about your whole crew. It seems like everyone, uh, you know, you see a lot of guys when they're doing stock hunts, that got full backpacks and extra gear and stuff. And you guys keep it real simple. And I mean, a lot of times you don't even have water or anything. So it's uh but there's a lot to be said with that there's a lot less that can go wrong too yeah yeah well right it's simple well and and i i put up that post today and and i said the first time i met dan there was some takeaways like i remember that it was i think i think i pixie dust you know like i don't and it, what i took away when i walked out of there is it reminded me you know so my dad was very just simple low key and it was more based kind of like what i took away when i walked away from you dan was you're really pushing more of the skill side and developing that of a hunter more so yes these products help whatever they might be and we were just talking about you know broad heads and and, and things on these shots that help but your main focus was the hunter skill is what i what yeah. i picked and i that's i that I never forgot that, you know, and I, I felt it was all, you know, it's, it just reminded me of some things that my dad, you know, ingrained in me. And I did have a period of time where I kind of went down, you know, some of the pixie dust, I don't want to say rabbit holes, but I yeah. kind of like, you know, you know, it's, it's like you're, you're stepping into late teenage years, adulthood a bit, and you're trying to figure out, the, you know, and explore a bit of what works, what doesn't work. And, and, and there's certainly, you know, a lot of great products that can assist the hunter, but that is the one thing that I, I, I specifically remember when I met you is uh, you, you seem to be more focused on the, the, the skill development of the hunter than just this product, that product. And, and, and I like that and it definitely resonated. So. Yeah. The main thing I remember about you is all these, uh, shows that we go to where you have parties afterwards and people don't get to see those and the music be blaring through the place and the real <laughs> show the real beer show would be after the show <laughs> yeah 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 we've talked it down a bit the last couple of years so hey, yeah uh, Jer jeremy uh me and uh jared were talking offline we had a conversation while i was supposed to be working and uh we decided we we're going to give a, a dvd away Oh, yes. so if you want to figure out uh, some way of doing that with the crowd, sure. Um, and then I can ship. It, I'll ship it on my end. Okay. So, awesome. So, uh, yep, I'll I'll put a 
guess the number. We got 250 people on, so we'll go. We'll go guess the number one to 500. Closest one to the number will. Closest one without going over. How's that? And, Sounds great. And uh, while we're doing that, Jared, one of the things that I want to talk to you about, you guys, uh, I, I don't know if, I don't want to say revolutionized, but definitely popularized and, and potentially revolutionized the use of spot and stock hunting with a decoy, right? I'm sure some people have been doing it before, but I'd say you guys made it famous the way Dan made hunting over beds famous. So um, <laughs> you, you've got a lot of experience in that, a lot of it on video. But I think that's something when people see it, it looks like fun. I've done it now since and had some success. So give me your biggest takeaways and and I'll repeat any of these, but this is kind of what I'd like you to talk about. Uh, positioning, when do you first show the decoy? How did you learn to shoot around it? Uh, major mistakes you've made. Have you ever used some of the newer bow mounted decoys um, like the ultimate predator, or the heads up, why or why not? So maybe just talk about like decoys in general and some of those topics there. Yeah, um, that came from from the way i remember it when i went to kansas with a bow the first time in 2011 scott and i or was that 2010 i don't know it was 2010 or 2011 i believe it was the 2011 season though yeah it was the 2011 season i filmed scott in 2010 in kansas i didn't have kansas and it was different air you know different type of terrain but in 2011 I had three and a half days in Kansas. We 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 were more weekend war whatever time. We didn't have a lot of time back then. So between him and I, we had seven days. He had a different part of Kansas. I had a different part. We split it down the middle, three and a half days. My area happened to have a lot of like cattails and grass. And a lot of the cattails were short enough you could actually kind of stock these deer in. And uh I ran into troubles because in a lot of situations there wasn't enough and they were just, it, they were very difficult to get close to in that particular setting. And I had three, three good bucks that I would have been very happy with three year olds or better for three and a half day window that slipped through the cracks on me. And all three of them, I, I, I think I clean missed all three. They were high intensity situations where I just would have, if I would have just had something to buy myself a few, you know, two extra seconds, wouldn't have had to rush the shot, things like that, that, you know, and that's another thing. It's like, once you get to enough, you get enough experience, you know, and like Chansey is phenomenal at this, you know, reading, like once they got you pegged exactly how much time you got. And, and, and it's like, you can sit there and try to train yourself as an archer to like, up, oh, just slow it all down. But if you've got enough experience as a hunter, you can read that animal and you're like, I ain't got four seconds. Right. <laughs> it's now or never, you know? So anyways, uh, here again, getting sidetracked a bit, getting back to the decoy. I needed something to buy some time a, a bit. We actually went to, um, some uh tried to find just some flat cardboard on that hunt to cut something out but i'm no artist like chancy and <laughs> chancy can do that he can just whip something up that looks like a deer decoy and in a matter of minutes uh, out of a piece of cardboard um and has done that <laughs> and it has worked um however uh i'm not you know nothing nothing we put our heads together worked with on that we had a short window the next year that's when I had the idea for the decoy and Chancey had been doing this and talking about this with Turkey, what he did with turkeys, uh, you know, using the decoy to, you know, obviously a whitetail is going to be trickier to pull that off with, but I was like, this might actually work and it beats, I'm, I'm and three on those situations. So I might as well try. And now the next year we broke it out and we didn't, it didn't work. And I think, you know, I had people that thought it was a joke when they seen it in the video, I was trying to do yeah. <laughs> what we and I caught some things in the video when I was editing it that I was like, okay, these are the changes we need to make to this decoy. And we made those, and then it might work. It, you know, will run a higher probability for sure. And so, um, we did those changes to that decoy, uh, Shay did did you know put some fur and kind of put a deer head on it, and that's what I knew we needed that to to uh, once I saw the video footage of what was going on, there was just too much shine and sheen, and then you were drawing attention to yourself 
on a buck that was locked up with a doe. And now it's just like, now you can't even get close to break the threshold to, to where he'll come in. And it just, that I learned a, a, a quite a bit in that 2012 with that first generation. Yeah. And Let she, me interrupt you real quick there. You said the, the threshold and that's kind of one of the points I want sure. to get at from my own experience yeah, yeah. is, okay. is I feel like a lot of people think you get to a certain distance, let's say 400 yards and you hold up the decoy and the buck's going to come running in. My experience has been, if it's a buck locked down with a doe, you need to get close enough where that buck wants to fight you because bucks typically are kind of like elk. You show a decoy too soon. They'd rather, or you call too soon. They'd rather push the the does or the cows away from you than come fight you, right? So what's the distance you found where they're more likely to come investigate than they are Unless to run the doe off? they're just one of them special old ornery bucks that just loves fighting. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we've, it's, it's risky business. Uh, and that exactly what you just said there, that's one thing, you know, it worked really well for us in 2013. And then, you know, there was a few year period there where, you know, it was like, mm, it's, you know, it's still just a tool that sometimes it's maybe not the best to use it at all. Sometimes, you know, it's like, you got to read the situation and read the animal. And, and I mean, there's definitely many times we've, watched a buck that's locked down with a doe that has satellite bucks coming in. And it's like, okay, this one doesn't let him get within 70 and he's coming. So there's my threshold. Now this one's letting him get all the way to 2025. Uh, I mean, you're not going to have, you know, or even closer at, on times. And that's that threshold. Every buck have, has a different tolerance level of what that threshold is. So sometimes you don't have those satellite bucks around to be able to gauge where that threshold is. And, and so I generally, if I'm going to use the decoy, I generally like to do exactly what you said, go in as if he doesn't know you're there, get as tight as you can before popping that up and break that threshold generally. Now it won't be the next video coming out. Um, it'll be the one after. And uh, now Tanner did something with, but he went, he used it from a long ways out. And in that situation, he had to, he couldn't, he couldn't do it any other way. Um, and it worked. He, he worked, you know, he did it diff, you know, just used, didn't push things too, too much, but it ended up working and he, he killed an old buck. It would, it's not a high scoring buck, but it was a gnarly old, probably weighed 260 field dress mega, you know, oh, wow. mega, yeah, 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 yeah. Both him and Chancey, you know, the the one I call it the Arnold Schwarzenegger. I figured that one was <laughs> two seventy. I I mean, they just the way they looked, the bodies were so built up in the. Uh, they they must have been into a pocket where the jeans ran really, really phenomenal for heavy body weight right there. Um, but uh, anyways, it worked on that. On and and Chancey killed one similarly to that uh as well um so um but yeah as far as that decoy goes it, it can it can burn your ass real or watch my friends here we're live right <laughs> no, <you're good. laughs> uh, but it can burn it can burn a guy too and so you know we re realized it, it's a it's just another tool you know it's, right. it's like um you know, it's 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 like a grunt tube or a, or a snort wheeze or a, a rat, rattling horns or whatever it might be that's a tool bag for the hunter. It's like not always going to work, not always going to be the right situation to use it. Timing's got to be right. The doe can't be too edgy. If the doe really loves the buck she's with, she's going to be like, she's going to see it coming from a ways away and, 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 and be like, I'm getting out of here. I don't want nothing to do with this. Maybe she's been irritated by a bunch of bucks that she didn't want to be with and then you know, this buck she found she liked and she's sick of pissing around and she just doesn't want to deal with it. And a lot of times the doe is the one that that doesn't like, you know, doesn't like it. But we've seen it flip the other way, too, where she's like maybe not too, you know, maybe she's still trying to upgrade with the buck, you know, and, and she's like, ooh, who are you moving in? You know, like <laughs> every doe is different, you know, so – we got some questions in the chat and this question I had too about calling. So what's your experience with calling in combination with the decoy specifically? Chansey does that a lot. And Chansey is a phenomenal caller and has a lot of experience. And 
he he is way more mastered in that art of calling when to call how to set up perfectly for you know the scenarios read the animals right i don't generally do a lot of a lot of calling i it's well it's for one thing i like the visual the stock st side of it so not that i haven't i you know i mean i haven't done a ton of calling um well i take that back i mean i've done enough just more not as much in recent years you know the first video i rattled in a few bucks called in a few bucks that, that was kind of a unique situation where there was a pocket of does 300 yards away and i'd watch these bucks come off this hill and i couldn't hunt there i'd rip it up with the rattling antlers and after they went and checked the does and found none, they heard that in the back of their head. And I just planted the seed and they'd come in. And so it worked, you know, but Chance is really good at it. I've watched him call him in from 400 yards out with a with just a grunt. Uh, you know, he's he, he does it internally um, so he can really beller at him and really read the animal. Well, um, I did have a situation and that's on the video. I don't think maybe I had the decoy set for that one, but I called a few bucks that all came in off this ridge and none of them I was really interested in shooting, but um, they all kind of wandered back to that ridge. And that was an indicator to me that they were satellite bucks and there was probably a shooter up there in the timber somewhere locked up with a doe. And so we spent some time dissecting in there to find, and I ended up, that was like eight hours in the timber, but I ended up getting that one that buck uh finding them we lost you know and here again it, we lost visuals three times because satellite bucks would come in and jib jive and they'd go reposition and got to go refine them back and and whatever but i'm getting sidetracked i don't have as much experience as chance he has on that he he loves to take that decoy in you know into the timbers and you know when he's not in the prairie settings and and does a lot of calling now he with it now he hasn't rattled in any any mega giants. He's always seeking for a mega giant, um, and and killed one with that. Although in that resurgence, he should have had about a two fifteen inch buck, cold turkey. I shouldn't bring it up. He he didn't. He just first day out there, just cold turkey walks in there. Had gotten some borrowed some antlers, forgot his antlers back in Iowa. Found some guy at a gas station to borrow some dried horns. And he didn't have a lot of confidence in the antlers and he did a set and it was, he, he is so on point when he calls too, like not doing this. And that's why he was so pissed and punched a tree and, and, <laughs> uh, but he got caught on his phone when this buck walked in and it was so close to getting him, but that would have been uh, a, a mega giant that he would have called in. And he, he's definitely called some in, uh, but I, don't recall usually he's he's getting in there off of visuals a lot of times um but he's very good at calling we had one a few years ago it was you know probably a 175 inch buck that one i was filming him and he called that one with a grunt from 400 yards at least out read it we didn't have a lot of time no time to get ahead of the deer and he he had him coming in but some things didn't work out <laughs> so that's on, I think, the ride video. I don't know which one. Somewhere back in that era. So, no, good points. And Dan, uh, Dan actually had quite a bit of luck with the grunt call last year, right, Dan? Yeah, yeah, I did quite well with it. I every time I'd uh, play a tune on that thing, a deer would come running. So that, last year was a pretty good year. But, that was uh, the one Scott Buckley said didn't work too, right? Yeah, yeah. He he borrowed me one because I forgot my. I went actually. Uh, I went out and. Uh, hunted and I was bringing my grunt call on. I was having some action when I'd see a deer pulling it over and I get to my tree one day and I got into this little um, thermal hub that was way back and found where there was some really good sign and, and I'm sitting there and I turn around and there's a booner walking in and I reach for my grunt call and it's gone. Then, uh, wow. <laughs> so uh, God had borrowed me one and uh, uh, it worked out quite well. I mean, uh, I called in a booner that, that first, I, I actually, me and you talked on the phone about that buck. I wounded it. Yeah. Um, and then I, uh, then, uh, the day after I called in that, that, uh, booner and wounded in Iowa, I got pissed about that, about losing them. Yeah. And, uh, I went back to Wisconsin 
powdered in my hands for a day and then finally wiped myself off and went out hunting. And the very next hunt, I got a 170 walk sitting here. Yeah. Uh, first, actually, it grunts in some trees and I grunted back with that same call. And it just came walking right out to that call like nothing. So dear. Uh, no. But, the, you know, you were talking about the calling and the um, decoying and stuff. And I think a lot of people in the audience um, probably don't um, hear it as the way that I'm hearing it. They're probably hearing this glorified thing where, you know, I could just take a decoy out there, run up, put it out, and the deer's going to come running in. And actually, I mean, uh, it probably fails more than it succeeds. But, it's, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but I would, I would say that if you have the opportunity, you're sneaking in there and killing that thing without the decoy. And most of the times when you use that or the calling, it's good you have to. In that yes. situation, yeah, a lot of well rounded and be able to do all different kinds of things to kill these deer. Yeah, yeah, a lot of times it is that way. And as you were telling that, I can't believe I forgot about this. I filmed Chancy uh, on not the next video coming out, the one after, and that's a situation that you, what you just described there. He had been on this buck for four four days. And just, he, he just wouldn't get on public. This buck wouldn't. And the first night he had him, he didn't have permission. He had him just across the line. He didn't have permission yet. He hadn't contacted this guy. And, and uh, so he couldn't take the shot. He ended up getting that night, getting in contact with the guy, got permission to, you know, hunt there if need be. And anyways, he was on this buck for four days. And uh, TC filmed filmed up until that point and then the last day uh he had to go and i stepped in for that last day and as luck would have it of course right when tc leaves uh we get our opportunity right at right at first light we got on a spot and chancy just read the animal it was too too dark yet to see it was you know if it was this buck he read the situation He's like, he lost his dough. He's done with his dough. He's on the move. We're going to lose him potentially for days or, or weeks with where he's headed. we got to go now. We don't know if it's him, but I think it is. And we didn't have, you know, it was one of them deals. we got to get there right now. He's on private, but it's the uncuffed private, right, that borders the public. We come in on the public side, got there just in the nick of time to verify, yep, that's him. And there's a prime example of what I was just talking about. He did call this one in. What I just said, you know, I don't think he's called. No, he called this buck in. It's a 179-inch tight, tight, tall 10, and he he did it just right. I mean, we were in a scramble. Yep, that's him. It's like you got seconds, and he's going to be crossing the road. He was moving across the square, and he got set like that. Didn't worry about me, what I was doing, and – made one little subtle call to that deer. I froze. I was still trying to get in a position. The deer looked over and then he's chance. He's really good at like reading all those subtle, you know, like, and he called it like a book. As soon as that deer licked its lips or something, you know, he was just like, he's, he's, he's going to come. He just hasn't made the decision yet. I'll get him, you know? And, and, uh, he hooked him and that buck come and, uh, he, he had a 12 yard, he crossed right onto the public. So, um, and he could have shot the other side of the line too, but it was cool. Cause we were, he was like, I don't know, five, six yards from the public line chance he was. And the buck ended up crossing right there. And, and he was a 12 yard shot. His arrow hits a weed, the size of my thumb misses the buck runs by him. Chance he had the decoy set, you know, he brought that with just in the event he'd need it. Um, you know, but the buck run right by him at probably five yards and then stop at 18 yards in the weeds on this side of him, still on the public. And his only shot was the neck right there. He was buried in the, these horse weeds now. And he just sent that head that, that we used that inch and a half cut right through and up. It come out the other side of his, you know, that far. And it was over. He sent another one into him, but it was, oh yeah. I mean, it was, it, it was a pretty cool, high intensity, like Chancey nailed it on the calling on that one. So I just a few minutes before that, I was like, well, he should have had that 250. And uh, well, yeah, he killed that. I can't believe I spaced out on that one. Uh, but 
exactly what you just said there is a lot of times we don't like to go to calling unless it's like we need to. Uh, mm-hmm. And that was a situation where it, uh, that was the only way. I mean, he was going to be gone. He's cruising. He's heading into a n- another section. There's plenty of does down there. He's probably going to find one and might never get a crack at him again. So, you guys don't have a lot of low intensity hunts, as far as I've I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they get they get they get wild out there sometimes. But that's the you know I mean that's what keeps it addictive for you know too you know at times. Uh, but because uh, a lot of crap can go wrong, you know. So. Yeah. Well, Jared, let's do two more, and then we'll uh, start fielding some from the audience. Yeah, so, for sure. One of the things that I want to talk to you about was, and, and I've heard you mention this, but I think it's an important point, and it's not a very well-known point, so I think it's worth mentioning again, is you've talked about bumping bucks with a lockdown doe, giving them 30 to 45 minutes, and then you know they're ahead of you within, you know, depending on the terrain, 100 to maybe five, 800 yards. So talk yeah. about that and maybe a story or two of, of where you've done that and then successfully got back on that buck. Yeah. Yeah. That's mainly in like timber stuff. And I'm not going to say that that's work that will work every time. Every situation is different, but sure. we've, we've ran a very high rate and it was an accident the first couple of times. The, the first really good stock that I think we had on video was that second year. It was an that we launched the second year season where we launched the all public land season. I had a, I was still running some tree stands back. You know, we did those first few seasons. We played the ground game, some and tree stands, Jeff jive. And I took a uh, tree stand in and well, two Andy was filming and I was hunting, took two 10 pound tree stands in way back into this pocket. I had drawn an Iowa tag and got in there and, within an hour it was kind of already a shit show i i didn't i hadn't been in there so i just i parked on another road i did just looked at on some well actually i didn't have the aerials i don't think maybe google uh, earth but i mean that was back in 08 i remember having a book that just showed me where the public was but i think i got it pulled yeah, up it somehow. and uh yeah iowa sportsman book i think is what it was called yeah. sportsman's atlas or something um but anyways I tried to come in from one road. Well, they had just gotten a bunch of rain and I couldn't get over. I, you know, I didn't, I was just bombing in this car. Didn't have a lot of room in it. Didn't think I'd need hip waders or whatever. Cause it was just a little ditch is what it looked like on, on what I needed to cross. Well, no, it would have been up to my neck. So, you know, can't take camera gear in there. Uh, you know, I mean, it just, you know, so we ended up back coming around this other section and had to walk in, I think about a mile and a half, two miles. Well, I know it was over a mile, um, about a mile and a half, two miles route in. It was a big section, bigger than your normal one by ones. Um, and took the tree stands. So it's like two hours into the day, but we were kind of a couple, 300 yards from where I wanted to get and bumped a, what looked to be a big buck on a doe. And they went running in the direction I we were headed anyway and we didn't go too much further and put up the tree stands quick and just even though we're hour and a half two hours something like that into the day let's let's just set up shop here for a little while so we did for about an hour and then i got cold i was about 150 pound body weight back then didn't have much body fat and get cold real easy and uh and so i didn't pack enough clothes and i was like i'm bored i'm cold let's, let's go check this piece out. Let's snoop around a little bit and see what's, what it's about. And, uh, I don't think we went a hundred yards that direction of beyond, you know, where our tree stands were in the direction that buck and that doe went and boom, pegged him. And then we had to, you know, figure out a game plan. I think there were six or seven satellite bucks throughout the day that we had to jib jive and weave around and lose our visual, do a big, like five, 600 yard loop coming at another angle before. I think we ended up, if I remember right after we did that, I think we had to back back out because the wind direction changed or something on us. I can't remember. It's probably in the video, but anyways, it took a good portion of that day. I think it was about, I think it was five hours or five and a half hours. If I remember right on that whole 
playing that game from the time we had the visual to to, to when I killed him. And um, uh, where was I going with that? Uh, I can't remember exactly where I was going with. Oh, yeah. So that was – and I didn't put it together then, the accidental bump. You know, like – when we climbed out of the tree stands, I wasn't kind of in my head. Like I knew a big buck could, but I hadn't actually like process, you know, like put it together as a possible, like I figured they kind of kept going. There was also like a, a river, not that ditch I was talking about, but I was like, it didn't really cross my mind that they were, they were just, just beyond. And we ended up killing that buck. And then we ended up doing that a couple of times on accident and then I started thinking about it and I'm like, I think I was on a hunt and it was complete lockdown, just dead as shit. And somewhere in there, I was like, I'm just going to walk. This timber's open enough in this particular case. I can cover a lot of ground just, and I'll get my visual cause it's open enough that it's, I'll get my visual to confirm it's a shooter. And, and that's when we kind of started implementing that into the woods at different times, mainly during lockdown when it's like, I need to cover ground. I only got a few days or whatever. And they're definitely locked down. I'm not even seeing satellite bucks anywhere, nothing. I'm going to go cover ground. And, you know, if it's a timber style hunt, we'd cover ground. And then it's like, what we always found is the direction we last seen them when they're locked down like that, they, they were, were a hundred to 400 yards. I mean, I, I, I've seen them barely make it out of sight in the timber. And so we just put on the brakes for half hour, 45 minutes, let them calm down from the direction they ran, assume they're just up ahead. But now it's like this little pie plate, you know, it's different, you know, by the time you get out of rut or, or even probably, you know, now they're doing the loops and the big swings, but when they're locked down with that dough, it's like, they headed in this direction. If it's now open country, that's a different scenario or partially open country. But in the timber, it's it, it's like, okay, they went this direction. I can pretty well figure they're going to be right in this pie plate somewhere within 100 to 400 yards, you know. And and now I just covered a bunch of ground, got my visual, gave them a little time to calm down. And now I can tiptoe in there and get the wind exactly kind of the direction I, I want it to be. And, and it's worked out um pretty well well, it worked out accidentally you know first and then it developed into a a technique and i've had other guys implement that that have gotten a hold of me during lockdown and i'm like you got nothing to lose and and you 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 know go try it and it has worked for them i'm not saying here here again it's another technique that sometimes um (coughs) you know now Tanner has done this in the plains of Kansas. When they get into full lockdown out there, it can be a son of a gun to find a big buck at different times. You know, once they get into that full lot, it, it can be gangbusters and then they, they get fully locked down. It's just like, it's pretty open, but where the hell did they go? And he'll go walk a damn ditch, you know, that he suspects something might be in, you know, you know, one might have a, a you know, dough pegged up and he's done this, on his own more so before uh, my videos where he'll just go walk. The, and he's done it on the videos too, but I know he's killed some this way from what I recall. Definitely was a strategy that if some other things didn't go wrong, you know, I don't, I can't remember the details on it all, but he'll go walk them ditches once they're in full lockdown and he's, you know, not getting them from the vehicle in those open prairies and blow, blow one that he doesn't know exists out of a ditch and then just watch it run for the next mile and a half and then he'd make calls, uh, you know, or stop into who owns that property and see if he could get permission. Now he's got his visual and he's, he's he can spend the rest of the day on him. So, I mean, it's not necessary, you know, like in the timber, it's this pie plate. It seems like they're kind of going to be right here. In the open country, that's another technique that can, can work, but they're going to go a lot further and they might start looping a lot more and stuff like that. So, um, hope that kind of covers that one. Yeah, and I, I don't know too many hunters that wouldn't take the chance if you imagine that's a question a lot of people have. Yeah, I, yeah, the the amount of time to produce it the way that I want to produce it to, we were talking about this, I think, before we went live, like, you know, getting the, you know, talking about the audio and everything to, to, to produce it to what it ends up being. There's no way I could ever justify taking that 
you know, I could do some other things for YouTube that are easier to produce, but to produce and keep it that way, it just takes so much time and effort and energy that there's just no way to, to, that I can see right now to bring it back without reducing what it is. It's, it's like you, you want to push the limits and, you know, get every ounce of quality you can out of the audio. A lot of that comes down to post-production. It's not, it's not just the mics you're running. It's, it's a lot of the cleaning up and there's a lot to that, that unless somebody's done it, then they're not going to really understand that. But that's kind of in a nutshell, why I can't justify doing the, the films on YouTube. Sure. And I think Dan will attest to uh, YouTube's a, a dangerous place to make your living these days too. If you're a hunting channel, I think. Yeah. Well, and also I don't like the, um, you know, the way the algorithms work. It's like, got to get the next video. got to get the next video out. And it doesn't like, I want to do creative stuff and, and really build this story the way I want to the max. And it, I, it, it doesn't jive well with me when you've got an alg algorithm monster that wants you to produce more, 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 more. And, and I'm like, I want to produce better, 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 better. It's like the polar opposite. They don't mix very well together. Uh, so, you know, um, it, it would be easy for me to just go out into the garage and shoot a short video on something how to and produce that pretty high end because it's a more of a controlled environment and I'm not carving a whole mountain of footage to produce a story. I'm kind of going into it with this. So that's, that's maybe a little different something I would consider with YouTube or, or, or whatever, but not for the actual unscripted hunts and trying to produce what I'm trying to produce. So sure. Yeah. sure. It is kind of nice not to, uh, not to fund the uh, liberal machine that's out to get us. You know, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, Right, right. And that's the other, that's one of the other things you just mentioned there. I, a few years ago, I, I was kind of saying at times, you can't cancel DVDs. <laughs> right, right, right. You can't cancel DVDs, right? Uh, and, you know, I, I don't know what, what, you know, but I've heard, you know, I don't know if it's rumors or truth or, or what, but, you know, I've heard different times on different hunting channels, things getting restricted or, you know, monetization pay is, is low you know, for hunting content, you know, I've heard all that's that kind of stuff. And, and yeah, it makes you wonder, like you put all your eggs in that basket, it could get pulled out from under you one day. Um, so, uh, and you know, the other thing is, is, um, I, you know, we are talking about the algorithm machine wanting you to push more, 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 more. Well, there's a threshold point that I believe where it's it's very hard to keep pushing more 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 without kind of blowing blowing it out uh like drink too much water you'll drown kind of thing um yeah. you know and and i i i i believe that for a long time but denzel washington said that and he's he's my favorite actor for 20 years is jamie fox asked him why don't you do more movies? And that was his response. And I was like, that's a better way to put it than what I've had kind of in my head. You know, I mean, um, and, and there are certain ways I think to get around it, but uh, you, you know, it, you know, and be producing more and more and more, but it's gotta be new stuff and new characters and new, it, you know, to keep it going, you know? And I, I, I mean, um, there are samples out there, you know, uh, deadliest catch that show was only rated to, to last three to five years. And it, it blew their minds that it, you know, they, when, Do you know, in uh discovery channel, you know, they slate these shows, like what, what the, the lifespan of them is going to be to hold people. And that was only slotted for like three to five years before they were going to, you know, they're going to produce it for three to five years, blow it out of the water. And then, and then that would be it. But it, it held, you know, it's not what it once was, but it still held long enough that I think it's 23 or 24 years now. Um, you know, but you see these samples of different shows and different types of shows. They're real hot, but you're watching them all the time. And then it, it, it's not as, you know, interesting, you know, it's, it's, it's not as adventurous as it was the first time you watched it, you know? So it's, you know, it's something that I, you know, I, uh, I, I think, that could definitely 
apply on the YouTube side when it's almost like algorithm why algorithmically wise pushing you to more 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 more. It's like, eh, you know, and I don't want to say YouTube doesn't care, but they got enough creative new talent coming up like you know more and more people want to have a youtube channel that there's no shortage of 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 the next channel and the next channel so it makes sense why they would produce the you know or gear it towards more 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 um so and i'm not trying to beat up on youtube by any means i'm just evaluating the the pros and cons just like there i mean it's a there's some cons to doing DVDs in 2024 too. <laughs> you yeah, know? I have one of those white tail adrenaline machines. I heard that's what they call DVD players now. Yeah, yeah, Sony makes them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we got a question here from Hub Hanger. It says if you had one hour to hunt all season, when would it be, and what habitat type and setup? Ooh, if I had one hour to hunt, it would be. Probably, who I don't know. I don't know if I could pick a day, but probably November. Well, based off of last fall, I only got a few days in, and I I was fortunate to I did not kill, but I got on four shooters, I think, in three and a half days, uh, and that was mostly timber stuff. But the problem with the prairies is you can you can get into some really big deer, but you can have days and days of not getting, you know, if you're strapped just to public or some door knock. And that's that when you said an hour, that would be very difficult for me to do in that. Whereas, you know, I think there's some pockets I could potentially but an hour doesn't give you much time. You know, no. <laughs> uh, I, I almost pulled that exact thing off this year my buddy TC that uh, does some filming. He hasn't filmed with me a ton, but we walked in cold Turkey into a piece of timber and uh, without any visual or anything. And I think it was about 40 minutes or something like that. And I caught a little glint. It was some cedar tree, you know, some cedars and thick stuff down, you know, pretty thick, but there was little pockets where you could see 60, 70 yards out at times. I caught a little glint of you know, a deer pass. I didn't know what it was. And it took about five, 10 minutes and picked up on it. It was 160 inch nine pointer. Now oh, I didn't get him. I probably would have with a compound. It would have been a pretty easy deal. Cause he ended up pushing this dough that he was with and he was all fired up, you know, doing that, you know, the heavy grunting and many times, but we only had like a five, six mile an hour wind. And I was about to just back out, which is something I almost never do for the day because I felt like she was just coming into heat and it didn't appear to be any pressure and it was midweek. So I was going to back out and I wish I would have about five minutes sooner because we had the wind right. But when it's that soft and I got to get that tight on them, you know, I'm trying to get inside of 20. It's just, you got to go so slow and then you're trying to get into 20. Even if you got the wind condition 90% of the time, right. Or 95% of the time blowing perfect. It's, it's, it's just, it's almost impossible. So I was just like, you know, if we get out of here and I just, that's what my instincts told me. And that's a prime example of what we talked about earlier. I sit there, sat there and, you know, overthought it. And if I would have just trusted my instincts to get the hell out of there. And, and we were on our basically slowly backing out so we'd go undetected and and he caught it he caught the scent and and uh, i was like son of a gun because now you know good luck he's not probably going to drag her back in there or let her back in there the next day i mean he's an old you know i don't know if he was six or seven but he had that everything that looked like you know a deer that's it wasn't a three four year old buck you know sure. and i was like anyways in that scenario, TC, who hasn't, you know, done much of the tips, he's like, I want to hate you right now. <laughs> you know, and I was like, I, I, okay, I wasn't expecting quite that to happen. But uh, anyways, um, I feel like I would do that in an hour better in timber. Of course, I'm factoring Iowa in there too. And, and yeah, a lot of people don't know you, you moved to Iowa in the last year or two, right? <laughs> two years ago, okay. <clears throat> two years ago. Yep. So um, I'm, Keep in mind, I'm factoring that into the the hour time. Now, <clears throat> in Wisconsin, where I grew up, there, the, it, you know, there was some open pockets around these swamps. I grew up actually. 
I grew up part of the farm was on a swamp, but I had a big public land swamp. That's a different scenario up there. If I had an hour up there during rut, I would focus covering ground visually from the vehicle around the fringe areas. And, and I, that's, that's how I would spend my hour up there. You know, so every situation is kind of different of what, you know, but. Well, let's see. We got uh, a binocular question. Pharrell okay. says, what size do you use? And would there be any situation where you'd want a bigger objective lens? I pretty much always run 12 by 50s, even in the timber. Although if I was really tight, but I'm on the glass so much in the open country that I pull up 12s in the woods, it's I'm on point, you know, um, because I'm on I'm on the binoculars so often that it doesn't really bother me that they're 12s. And I really don't like missing my 12s. I, I got a pair of 10s too, but there's sometimes I wish I had my 12s that I found. And it's not really a restriction for me in that. A lot of guys would find 10s to be um, probably more appropriate in the woods, you know, but I prefer the 12s. And usually in the timber, although not always, usually I'm getting that vision with the naked eye first uh, in the timber. I'm just really focused on catching them that way generally versus glassing. Although that is pretty cool when you're just glassing and picking things apart and all of a sudden you pick it up in the binoculars. That's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, I agree. I'm a 12 guy myself, but I live out West now and it's uh I think the, the advantage of the 12s versus the disadvantage of maybe a 10, like when you're in the timber is, I don't know. It's hard, it's hard to argue against the 12s out West. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Out West. Yeah. Uh, tell us about your foot gear. There's a good one. How do they hold oh, up for gear. all the stock and miles? Oh, what, what do you I'll, wear? I, I will be right back. I'll sh show you what I wear. All right. And this is, I, I don't know if I'm on my eighth pair or what. But this is this is what I wear all the way down to five to ten below. Really? Is that right there? And what is and that? In the mountains of Idaho, too. That's that's what I wear. Now in the mountains, I would go a half size bigger because on the descends, my toes. So this is a 12, but I would go 12 and a half if I'm doing a lot of steep descends. And here's what I found out about my foot. For one thing, I like really light for stalking deer. But over the course of I always had issues with my feet getting cold. And it's because my feet sweat pretty bad. And so I started kind of going back the other. I used to, you know, for years I'd do, you know, thick, heavy, insulated boots when it'd get colder. And I've went the opposite way over the course of time because what I found was as it gets colder, if I just don't let my foot sweat, it'll get cold and chilled, but it won't really get super, super cold because it hasn't sweated. So if it's really early season, I'll wear the thinnest, shortest sock I can get because my foot's going to sweat even in that. And even though these are really light and these, I think are 11 ounces, they're super traction-y and I buy them same as anybody else. So I'm not pitching them, but I'm just saying that's what I use. Um, and, uh, I like them now when it gets colder and keep in mind when it's five ten below, I'm not sitting in a tree stand stationary sure. you know what i mean if i yeah. was though i would probably just do the same thing dang there and bring in like arctic shield boot overs or something once i got in there but what i do when it gets real cold like that and i've found this works really good is i'll put on a really thick wool sock and my foot still breathes pretty well and then if i get snow on top of it i'll put i've got two st styles of gaiters I've got a really thin light pair that's designed to keep the, the uh, and, and it's nothing I make, but um, it keeps the rocks out and it keeps the debris out because that's annoying to me. And uh, it'll actually keep your foot about 5, 10 degrees warmer. And then, uh, so there's a lot of tricks with, with that, but I hate, especially like if I'm doing like hill stuff, like we were in Nebraska a few years ago and we were doing some small pushes all day long. And I, I can't remember if we got two, three inches of snow or whatever. It wasn't a ton, you know, uh, but I mean, when it does get six, eight inches, I've taken these things right out. I run a high gator on that and I wouldn't do it any other way after running it like that because I don't have issues with my foot getting wet with those. 
as long as you get those in Gore-Tex and you run a good gator, you know, and I'm not crossing rivers with that though either. Um, but my foot's not, I'm not carrying 40 ounces of weight on my foot. Like put, put, you know, like hold a pound out here on the end of your hand. You know, it's like, you're carrying that weight. It's like, man, I'm flying over these Hills all day long on these dry, where it used to be like, you know, I, and I mean, that's back in my twenties. It's like, I'm dragging around 40 ounces and it's, it's, it's killing me compared to, you know, now pushing 40 wearing 11 ounces. It's like trail, you know, it's, you're blazing over these things. And so you're able to, you know, you're not drained for the next drive or the next, you know, and so that's, again, I got long on that. That's what I have found that I like the best. Did I miss it? Did you, did you say the brand and model there? Did I miss that? The what? The brand and model of that particular shoe. Oh, this is a solid, this particular one's a Solomon speed cross with Gore-Tex. Um, <laughs> I've had pretty good luck. I had one pair that had the Gore-Tex that did not hold, uh, it was not very waterproof, but the last few pairs I've had have been very, I've been very uh, happy with with that for for keeping you know water out. I guess you could say, um, but yeah, that's that's all I'll run I- anymore unless it gets real cold and I have to actually go to some real boot on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I I got you know I got some Danner Elk Hunters and I used to love those boots, but it's forty some ounces of footwear and it's like my foot's still damp, just as cold because it's sweating if not colder and i just kind of figured it out I, over the years like i'm doing it about wrong i'm carrying extra weight just to freeze the hell out of my foot anyway. <laughs> you know? uh so. next question here jared any chance for a beast and a white tail adrenaline hunt he would like to see jared and dan do some stalking together what do you guys think about that <laughs> well dan brought that up to me last year right yeah then I couldn't get a hold of you during hunting season because you go, you go uh, like recluse. <laughs> well, you got a hold of me, but I wasn't able to. I mean, I'll put it to you this way: in 2021, I think I bow hunted three or four days. I think is what it was. And you know, I mean, I'm got, I got a big project ahead. Of, you know, right now, um, not as big as the last one and much further along. But um, once I get through that, I'm not going to take on you know projects of the scale of this last one because they just they're just too big and i i i'm not even getting out there hunting much so then we can do something like i mean i think that'd be a lot of fun and and uh i'm sick of the prairies anyways so i know you mentioned something about like a timber uh you know deal and 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 i'm i'd love to do something like that uh you know five days six days seven days if you pick early october i'm probably gonna get my ass kicked because that's not really my my jam time in the woods, but, or hasn't been traditionally, but that's fine. I'm not, you know, I mean, it'd be fun. Well, you pick a rut and I'll probably get my ass kicked. I had, I don't know about that. <laughs> who cares anyway, right? Right, <laughs> we, right. You know, that's the thing is it's, it doesn't really, you know, we just have a good time. So. Right. Yeah. We could probably make something work sometime down the road here. Yeah. Yeah. This fall might be tight, but I think by next fall, you know, I think things will it'll free up there more for me in the fall. That's where I want to get it back, you know, get get back to where I'm getting out there a decent amount. And, and you know, the rest of the gang and the crew here, I mean, they're totally behind me on on that, too. You know, they're, as we're all getting older, it's like, you know, uh, you can't put, you know, like, you know, guys get married, they get kids you know families and businesses and they can't get out there as much you know uh you know like cousin jim where's he at i you know it's like well he only did one hunt and they didn't get out any elk so i can't justify spending a bunch of time to produce that you know uh but uh you know i'd like to get jim you know but the, you know as people get older i mean things you know they get busier with things and yeah. you know and uh there's you know not as much time to go around so um you know that's kind of where I'm going to shift things more uh, in the future is, is smaller scale and, and uh, get the, uh, you know, the guys kind of want to dial back a bit. Of course, Chancey, he'll still do the same, probably about 30 days if he needs to, he can't quit. That's what, you know, one thing <laughs> he just, neither can Tanner that both them guys are, you know, and Jeremy too. I mean, they, once they're into it, but I, I'm like, you can't, you can't Tanner, you can't do 120 days in a year and expect me to produce all that and get be, get out hunting too, you know, but <laughs> I didn't hold them back either. So, uh, 
but yeah. Uh, anyway. I've got a question from Hub Hanger. Says any advice for ground hunting in a ghillie suit with the effort to maximize harvest per hunt for four does and a and a three and a half year old or older buck. So I guess ground hunting would if you're going after does. What's uh, what are you going to do to maximize there and one good buck in there also? Ooh, uh, that one's a tough, tough call. Well, we found out in the prairie settings, I'm not a fan of ghillie suits, uh, and, and, which is why we don't run them. And and what I, again, a thing I picked up in the video, and I think I saw it in the field once with, when Shay was walking back to me. We ran on that one season and all the bunches of material that you got on there when the sun gets like this you got all these shadows and and it's just if you're laying flat to the ground then it's great the sun's on you you know but um now in that shadow highlight or timber setting or you know broken and stuff the ghillie suits i think are are great or if you're on the prairies and flat to the ground but they can be really devastating in my opinion you can look like a black bear out there if the sun's here it gets really dark with all that bunches of material and everything, just no lights getting around and, and through it. So um, I just want to put that point out there, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think they're great, especially, or can be great. You know, if you've got high, high volumes of deer and you're trying to not blow out the deer and you're going in for more of a, you know, to try to get one and get out of there without blowing a lot of deer out. I mean, to go undetected, I mean, that, that could be a very good, call as far as that goes um did i kind of answer that yeah can i get to that a little bit yeah yeah, yeah. So, in there so his uh question was something to the effect of uh how can he maximize his time get four doors and get a three-year-old buck yeah well in my opinion you should hunt the three-year-old buck the whole time and if you want to shoot a doe when one comes out shoot one but if you're hunting does and you're trying to shoot four does and hoping to get a three-year-old buck good luck you might get your does. You got to hunt bucks to kill bucks, but you can kill does while you're hunting bucks. So if you want to maximize your time, I think you need to maximize it for the trophy buck. But if you're willing to shoot a doe, shoot a doe while you're on that hunt. But otherwise, you're wasting time. I'm glad you, you jumped in on that one because that was perfect. <laughs> that 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 was perfect. I'm glad you said, "Hey, can I get in on that one?" Because that's spot on. Yes, yes, I think that. Yeah, w much better answered than what i did <laughs> uh jared tell us about your arrow quiver that's the whole question i'm not sure what Ooh, you got a specific my arrow quiver. quiver yeah well uh basically i just run like a matthews quiver on a belt is, is what i do i've got some things um i've made some different different things uh to make it a little more i guess functional for me out in the field um but uh that's that works out well for me i don't like the quiver on the bow for for me everybody has personal preference but i uh i don't like the quiver on the bow uh, and so that's how i like to run it um you got an editing question jared okay. uncuffed as an example what's your average editing time come out to per one minute of edited video so how many minutes or hours are you spending for one finished minute of video <clears throat> uh boy we'd have to run some some math on that i know between andy and i i know we busted five thousand hours at it between andy and i on on uncuffed in post-production uh i would venture to say probably closer to six on that and which i know that sounds extreme but uh it's like i like okay somebody else go produce 15 hours and go through 500 hours of raw content and carve that down and and make it you know it's like making these guys sound like they're coming right through the screen in 40 mile an hour winds when they're whispering and i mean that takes a lot of time and and it, not just to do it but to learn what you need to do to be able to carve that all out and that's kind of what i was talking about earlier why i i, I just I can't speed edit that to, to I'd, I'd not be able to do that. And, and it's, it doesn't have anything to do with the mics you're running. I mean, you, you know, I, I ran great mics for years and th those help in the end, 
better mics do, but they'll never, they'll never do what needs to be done. I mean, even on the big movie sets and, and, you know, those big high end controlled environments, I mean, you wouldn't believe how much time gets spent on post-production on sound and those are controlled environments. So, um, yeah, got carried away with that, but a lot. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's that. And that's been my experience too. And I don't do anywhere near the level of production that you do or, or some of the other shows that are producing, you know, what I would call more films as opposed to just videos. And, uh, yeah, it takes a long time. Even when you get proficient with the editing software, there's just, there's a lot to do. And, and if, if you want to uh, have a certain creative vision or whatever, just, this takes lots of time. Yeah. And then it's a dangerous thing because you're not like with like me, I'm never where I want to be with it. You know, so it's like you're always trying. To, well, then you just set a new standard that you now got to produce everything to this. So it's a, but it does match me and who I am. And so it's like, but it's a, it's a dangerous slippery slope. And I, I, I kind of realized that like, okay, I, this is, I'm not going to be, I, I'm always chasing. I don't have to try. That's just the way that I'm wired. It's like, I, you know, and so it's like, okay, the only realistic thing is I got to, cut back on how much gets filmed in the full, make the project smaller, uh, you know, cause if they're as big as this, I feel like I got to produce the whole thing. Then I feel like I got to produce it to what I'm capable of. And and so it's just, that's the double-edged sword you're dealing with there of like, okay, it's going to be great. The end of everything, but it's uh yeah. Huge <laughs> time. commitment. Here, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we got two or three more and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. So, okay. Pharrell says, how concerned are you with shooting through cover like grasses or woody cover? Have you done any testing for deflection uh, through any of that cover? Yeah, uh, grass, not a, I, I don't worry about that. Um, not with the setups that I'm running. Now, this last year, I'd been talking about this for a couple, three years with both Chansey and Tanner, and I know Chansey ended up, he ended up switching part way through the season uh, in Iowa, especially there's a lot of these like horse weeds is what he calls them. And I guess I, I do it too is these thicker weeds that are like the size of your thumb or your finger or whatever. And I mean, he's had that happen multiple times and there's no, you know, you can run all the tests you want, you know, but every weed and the point of impact with that arrow it's really hard to confirm like, okay, this definitely, but for sure, the more, the heavier, the point weight and the heavier, the overall arrow, if, if it hits the weed the same, it's gonna, it's gonna deflect less than a light arrow. It just is. And, and so if I don't need, so what a chance he ended up doing is he put a, you know, I, I was like, well, let's throw a 315 grain on your setup because I know it's tuned for, he's shooting a stiff enough arrow. It's it's, I've already ran it through the papers. You know, he runs a 125 main, but then an extra heavy up front for unique situations. And he's only like, I think he's 64 pounds and he's two inches or three inches lower by adding 200 grains to the front of the point. And that's something that, yeah, if he gets, if things get a little gnarly and he, you know, that's the arrow he's, he's going to send, you know, and I, I actually want one that's 500 grains. And, you know, a lot of guys would look at me like I'm nuts. Well, if I'm inside of 15 yards, it's not really going to matter with, with what I'm sending already. I thought, you know, I've got 500 grain field points. I, I would hundred percent run 500 grains in situations like that on the front. Cause it's not going to trajectory wise at 15 yards out of my setup. It's, it's going to land in there just like my two hundreds right now on the front. So um, as far as deflection goes, you know, and, and also now your broadhead choice, you know, so I, I, I am a big fan of just one blades and the biggest one blade that the setup is going to drive entirely through is what I like. And, you know, for the compound guys, I, I started kind of pushing a couple of ideas, their direction, like, and, and now they won't go back. They won't go any other way now uh from anything that they've seen and that is a one and a half inch cut one blade head because it's kind of like the best of all worlds i mean chancy drove it right through that big buck i was talking about a year earlier he's running 550 grains nothing extremely heavy Ch- tanner's running 500 he dropped one at 54 yards with that went right through the shoulder dropped that four-year-old buck right in its tracks and he didn't spine it and 
you know, it, it, we've seen it go through, you know, I've seen bleeder blades <laughs> and cut on contacts, good quality ones that are reputable and well built, but I've seen them with 596 grains stop at 12 yards out of a 70 pound compound. You know, you know, I got lifelong buddy sent me the picture, you know, and I've seen things sure. where I found biggest cut in a one blade that I, I can run. That's the best scenario for all types of getting through weeds, hitting grass, uh, hitting bone and getting through it, but you're still cutting a big pass. I mean, that is one thing expandable broadheads did really well is improving is one big cut direction. You get a hell of a blood trail or you can as long as it performs right. But the, the one big cut that that's going to, in my experience, what I've seen is a one and a half inch cut. One, one cut is going to leave a better blood trail than a one inch with quarter inch bleeders on each side. It just opens the whole thing up more so it can flow and, and, uh, and it can get through the bone, it can, you know, better. And so that's what I like now, you you know, it's like, uh, you, you get too small when you got the arrow force, like I've done really well with inch and an eighth heads, one blade heads out of my longbow, but you get too small when you got when you're blowing right through them, it's time to go bigger in my opinion, you know, and, and there's a, there's a point there where, you know, it could go potentially too far, but that's why you can't one size fits all it. You know, somebody comes along and they're shooting a 40 pound, you know, compound and trying to shoot deer quarter and two or something. I'm not going to send them with a one and a half inch cut, you know, one, but I'm going to, you know, load them up and go with an inch and an eighth, you know, uh, every situation and scenario is different. And that's why, you know, people get really hung up on this one thing. And it's like, well, yeah, it's great from a manufacturer's standpoint because they don't have to inventory nearly as many options. Right. Sure. But it, you, you, you just can't one size fits all it. I don't think as best, you know, um, but overall with our situations on white tails with, what I kind of laid out, I found that to be, and I wouldn't be afraid to go a little bit bigger from what I've seen. Cause we haven't had that seen that stop on bone yet, you know, and I learned the hard way with inch cut on contacts out of a compound 20 years ago. And, and so that's why I kind of went and, and, you know, partially because I was shooting other guys setups and partially cause I wanted to explore a little bit. I went and played around some, but I went straight to an inch and a half cut, uh, broadhead when I went back to a longbow and did well with that. I ended up eventually going to inch and an eighth. I didn't lose an animal because of, of an inch and a half, but um, I just wanted to kind of explore a little bit in there too. But I, I am a big believer of, of that. Uh, I mean, we've just seen too many things out there and that's, that's a perfect combo that I've seen. So sorry, got talking a little much there, but I hear, I hear all these, Sad reports. Just like two years ago, we were on a uh, tanner and I, and I guy hit a hundred and eighty inch buck, and it was a close fifteen yard shot. And you know, I I hear the report of you know, and I didn't know this guy before this, but he was you know very sad about it. I mean, it's a it was on public mega giant tanner almost killed it a few days before that, but um, where he hit it, and it's it's you know, I I had to ask kind of what broadhead, but I I didn't say anything. I didn't I didn't say much to that because i don't really know him i don't want to offend the guy but sure you know i'm like you know in the back of my head i'm just I, i'm like man i feel bad because if he didn't know and what i've seen and it, you know it's like i hear so many stories like that and i'm just you know there is no one thing that's always going to work but that's the best thing going that i've seen for how we hunt in all these situations so well, uh, before we wrap up, we do have a winner. So Easton in the chat, Easton, okay. you are the winner of the DVD giveaway. Um, do you want me to get his email or do you want to give your email, Jared? Maybe I'll get his. So, so you don't get a thousand. Emails. Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so, why, why don't you do that? Easton, if you're still watching or you're watching later, um, I'll post a comment, pin it that you are the winner. Um, okay. send, send your email or post your email and I'll give it to Jared and Jared will get you a copy of a dvd in the mail and if you're listening you already got some dvds just let me know which one there you go so that way you don't double up <laughs> yeah, there you go so All anybody right. wants to buy one of those dvds where do they go or, or what okay. else do you have you have uh, a lot of uh apparel don't you yeah i got a quite quite a bit of apparel uh low on the ladies line right now 
Um, but ladies love few, white tail adrenaline. That's what, that's what I just heard. <laughs> uh, yeah. Unfortunately, don't tell them that they're going to be pissed. <laughs> they're going to see my selection. It's just dwindle, you know, dwindle, dwindle down. Uh, got a, quite a few hoodies and t-shirts on there, but, uh, on the website, whitetailadrenaline.com is where I got everything. And then that's where the DVDs are as well. Um, and there are some trailer videos, um, on, youtube there's also a 20 minute chunk of uncuffed on youtube as well um that kind of leads into a hunt but it doesn't really give everything that's so. a pretty uh, spectacular looking buck on that clip also oh the one year the 20 minute uh, clip yeah that's that's yeah. the drop time buck right yeah yeah that was a very sad yeah yeah anyway i've given too much away <laughs> yeah cool i should have had one a big drop time that on there too so yeah uh, that was Tanner was on that one. And then uh, and did drop you times, it's like, it's like, I can't ever find a damn drop time. And then, <laughs> and then we both found mega in two different States, you know? So it was just stupid, spooky. And then uh, do you do any social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram? Any uh, of that stuff? What about yes. that? Um, got Instagram, Facebook, both white tail adrenaline and then uh, uh, TikTok. Uh, I know we've gotten a cut on there with a lot of subscribers. I, I'll be getting involved on that stuff a little bit more here at some point. Uh, but, but as people have come to know, I'm not very good at staying on top of social media. So I apologize. I'm just not wired too too much for it. But I am trying to get a little little more on top of it, a little better. I need to, you know, that's one of the one of the holes I can put some dirt in. So. And then last thing, I know you you guys typically do a lot of the show circuits. Uh, if people want to meet you in person, do you have any more shows planned this year that you're going to be attending? I, I don't for this year. You know, uh, we were considering Deer Fest. Just I, I'm going to have my hands full, and I just, of course, I, I'd like to do, but it's like, yeah, you got to start drawing lines, otherwise you're going to get yourself buried. You know, and it's like, it's like, okay, I got to get this, you know, next added out and stuff, and and so. Um, so yeah, uh, but possibly the next year, uh, Deer Fest, and then uh, the same shows we were at this year is what we got on the dock <laughs> as of now for next year. So which is Pennsylvania and Iowa and Ohio and Wisconsin. So awesome. Well, hey, that's uh, we, we ran through a ton of questions, ton of great information, Jared. I want to thank you for your time. This is the first time I had a chance to speak with you, and it lived up to the hype. So thanks for coming on, and I'll I'll turn it over to Dan. I didn't know there was hype, but oh yeah, oh there's all well, the hype. <laughs> thank you guys thank yeah. thank you both for having me on and everything i really appreciate it so oh, uh, you know thank you jared i mean uh uh i love you the shows and stuff you're always like an upright guy there's a lot of uh shady characters in this industry and you've always been uh one of the good guys and uh i appreciate what you're doing kind of in the same regard to what i do i mean you're, you're helping people grow as hunters you're helping the sport move you know move forward and uh, I really look up to that. So uh, yeah. I appreciate you. Thank Thanks you. So I, I, that means a lot that you said that. I I appreciate that. And uh, same, and the same goes back to you too. And that's the first thing. Like, I mean, we haven't really hung out. Like, I don't think after the shows and drank a beer or whatever. But I've I've liked you since I met you. And I I that's what I always retain. You know, there's. I, uh, when I met you, that's, that's, I walked away and there was, you know, I, I've been called my whole life. Hey, you're different or you're whatever. And, and, and but it's not necessarily a bad thing. And it's like, I walked away from you and I was like, I like what he's doing there. You know, just the hunter skill and, and, and also not, you know, really, you know, not, it's, it's not this, you know, uh, we we're talking about this on OKS Hunter. It's not this like pedestal like thing. It's like we're all grown and trying to get better and and everything and none of it. And it's like it gets into such a measuring contest sometimes. And it's like I'm trying to work on getting better myself. I don't need, you know what I mean? Like I don't need to get into the. So I like that what you were selling, you know, what I'm saying you were selling, but what you were just speaking back then is, is mm -hmm. you know, you believe in the pixie dust is what i remember the pixie dust, you know and i, I was just like i, I like it's amazing it. but uh now i mean uh it's like everybody's on board i mean we've changed the whole world really in the public land and yeah. uh in the beginning it was 
basically me and you. <laughs> yeah, well, and 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 I kid you not, I I didn't think there was any other public land videos on the market besides, you know, Benoit had produced a couple. You didn't have the social medias in the World Wide Web like it is today, where it's like everybody knows. And I I I didn't know. I come to that show and I was kind of doing my own thing, and then you know you're there with some video, and I'm like, huh. Ah! <laughs> you know, because, you know, it's like the undiscoverable, you know, and I think that's one thing that the show is years ago. It's like, you know, I, I've talked to many exhibitors and it's like, oh, the shows aren't quite what they used to be. And it's like, no, they're not. But I online is is we never had that before. I mean, people would go to them shows to to meet new people and explore. They, they didn't have access. You know, maybe they read a magazine and or, or something like that and picked, but you, you didn't have it right at your fingertips. And that was the first time I ever knew or had heard of you. And, 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 and I mean, I didn't, I had, and I, I'm sorry, but I just didn't, I didn't ever, I mean, and so I, I just didn't and uh, didn't know you, there was, you know, uh, the blood brothers videos and then you had some, something else in there, I think too, but I didn't know those even existed. You know, um, and I met you and I just, I was, I kind of almost felt like I was infringing for a second when you're talking like no pixie dust and what you got going on. I was just like, well, I didn't know about the, you know, a little bit, but I still liked what you had, what, you know, what you were all about. And and that's one thing you've never, I, I've never sensed that anything has shifted in, in that. And I always admired that. So. Yeah. For me, it's never really wavered. It's always been about making people better hunters and hunters yep. better people and that doesn't stop at me i mean that grows among the whole you know group of us you know and that's what i admire about you is is, is like still to this day you're not taking sponsors you know i think yeah. some but only some if i really want to work with them but uh yep. i mean i admire that i mean you just paint it on your sleeve and you're making all your money off the dvds and that's not not easy to do no no, no, and that's another thing. You got to produce a one they want to buy again, so it's got to be to a pretty high <laughs> level. If you're doing DVDs in 2024, I believe we're now the last one in the hunting space still producing a DVD. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, but um, but I also like it because it kind of keeps me in check to produce the best thing I can. Um, you just had mentioned one thing there that that uh, gosh, what you had just said. Uh, uh, it was important to me. Uh, About never wavering. Yeah, yeah. You know. Uh, oh, yeah. I did want to say. You know, I've never done any any uh, money sponsorship. You know, there's a couple companies. Uh, okay, I use this a lot. You build a quality product, and and you know, like uh, you know, now I get, I do get free arrows and and broadheads from Grizzly Stick. Bought them full price for seven years. You know, that's not, it's not BS. That's, that's what I did. I mean, I was offered a discount when he discovered that I was running his stuff. He didn't, he loved what I was about too. And, and, and he, he cared over there and, and uh, he loved what I was about, but I, I wouldn't take even a discount for seven years. And then he, he's like, just take the damn arrows. And I'm like, <laughs> Well, that's what I'm calling you about is to buy more. So I was like, that's what I'm going to run. Fine. I'm sick of this. He's like, I'm going to get you all set up with the guys if you want. But just take. And I was like, please do, because I just I know what we what needs, in my opinion, ran that, you know, and some of my guys had already started converting anyways to, to kind of the setup that I talked about earlier. And it's it's been working out well. But anyways, I wanted to kind of clarify on that so it doesn't get a little bit muddy to people. I don't consider it a sponsor unless it's a money contract or some side sort of money exchange. And it's definitely, you know, there are a couple companies, you know, that I've, I'm using their stuff already, but it, just keep in mind. And, you know, I mean, I'm considering some things in the future on the archery side, um, you know, but I don't think that makes you a better hunter. You kind of, what we were talking about earlier of, you know, like, yeah, this is a tool and it can help assist me, but it really comes down to, to really honing your own self the best. And then it's, you know, and that's, I mean, products are great. If we didn't have them, we wouldn't have an industry and an industry is important too. And yeah, you one, know, um, a one size fits kind of all fun. industry is a very small industry, right? <laughs> you, can, you can take a, uh, a really, you know, a uh, good person and, 
can taint them without them even realizing that it's happening. And case in point, I mean, I'm always really careful about who I get my name behind. Well, most yeah. people aren't, but I am because I don't want I don't want to uh, push stuff onto the people that I don't believe in, or I believe is uh, the owners of the company are are not good people, yeah. or the, the place they come from. And I had done a a, a a deal with a boot company. I won't name them, but uh, they offered me a whole lot of money, and I took yeah. it. And I figured, well, people got to have boots, and they're good boots. They they work and stuff, right? And uh, you know, it started eating at me that it was like I didn't like uh, the country they were from. I didn't like uh, um, some things, but I liked the boots and. I, I found a better boot, but I couldn't make, you, you know, that kind of money from the guy, but I liked the guy. So I went with the other guy, you know, and that boot came back, company came back to me and offered me an ungodly amount of money where I could just quit my job. Wow. And uh, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to do it. And, and she sat me down and she, she, she told me what my uh, motto is, you know, again, yeah. you know, with the, yeah. uh, uh, Make hunters better hunters, and you know. And uh, I said, "You're right. I'm, I'm doing. It. I'm justifying it because of, you know, my greed to get money. You know, and, and I turned them down flat. Said, don't make any more offers, and I walked yeah. away. And I think that most good people seem, you know, sober people. Yeah, say, yeah. Well, you know it, what? It, I'm going to justify doing that because you know I deserve this money. I deserve to have my show go forward. I deserve to get out of work and have more time editing." I deserve all this and I'm not really hurting people. People need those, this product. Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, I don't want to, you, you know, one of the things was uh, I had to tell people things that they wrote in a script and do things a certain way. And it wasn't that I believed what was on the script, you know, but you start to want to justify what they're doing. So I, right. uh, Carol was absolutely right that I was leading down the dark path because, yeah. You know, I saw a light at the end of the tunnel, and uh, you, you, you know, if you don't ever dive into that, you don't ever get that temptation or fall on the wrong path. And that's what I've admired of you. And you've been doing this, I, I think, from about the time I went from Blood Brothers to Hunt and Beast, which was like 2006 ish. Yeah, Isn't that about yeah. When you got started? I, I well, I met you in '09 at that show um, okay. in Minnesota, and I think. Uh, I think, yeah, right around that era, I remember is when you kind of kicked off, but I think you were still doing the blood brothers thing, but it was, I think within a year or two of that, that you had, you know, kind of, uh, moved to the hunting beast, you know, and, and started that, that, and, um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, that's exactly what you just said there. That's exactly why I wouldn't be any good at it. Like I wouldn't be any good at, okay, I got 12 or 15 sponsor bosses. Yeah, they could, you know, they now have say in what, what gets produced, how my show is. But if I got to try to sell something that I don't really believe in, it's going to go completely against my, and, and when you were talking about a path, yeah, it's a dangerous path because you start going down it and creating all these, you know, well, yeah, but it's for my, you know, or whatever. And I'm, I'm, I'm not talking, I'm not trying to point fingers at anybody. I'm just saying as an individual for me, that could be a slippery slope. If I ever went down that you begin to pathologize uh, a, a certain level of deceit. And pretty soon it's like more and more and more. And then it's, you know, and then it's this possessive of deception that comes over and you don't even realize you reach a point where, I mean, uh, you know, it's like the, the person doesn't even realize that they've, that, uh, I mean, it's, it's lying, you know, I mean, you know what right. I, I mean? And pretty soon they don't see it that way. You know, it's, it's like, Oh, I worked hard to, 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 to do that, you know, or whatever. And it's like, yeah, but you, you just, you completely, you know, it, it just doesn't match with me. And it's like, I don't, I don't have any desire, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I got a nice truck a few years ago, you know, but I drove pieces of crap for a long time. I rent, I, you know, I, you know, and I, I you know, I kind of, I work out of where I rent, you know, but it's, it's a little more than I'd like to pay for rent, but I spent a lot of time here. 
Um, I downscaled from what I had in Wisconsin, some uh, about 30%. I didn't need quite that much space, but it was different parameters back then. My sister was helping me and her and her college roommate wanted a place and it just worked out cash flow wise that it was like, Hey, this was perfect, you know, at uh, what I had in Wisconsin. But you know, it's like, you know, it's, it, it doesn't take much to satisfy the human, you know, mind if it's, if the human mind is set right. It, it, it really doesn't, you know, and if you study, you know, millionaires and multimillionaires and billionaires, the, this, I mean, the, the suicide rate is very high there in, in, in that category. And the level of unhappiness is very high because extremely high because it's never enough. It's just, yeah. it's, you it's, remember the conversation we had, uh, I don't know, it was this morning or yesterday when we were on the phone, whenever we talked, uh, I mean, yeah. all those kids that come up to me at the, the show is just constantly being like, I love hunting. Hunting is my favorite thing. And I just, I love everything about deer hunting and I love the shows and I love the stuff you produce and stuff. And I want to do this. I want to get into the hunting industry. And what do I have to do to get into the industry or to get to your level? Remember what I told you? I told them, yeah. I'm a doctor or a lawyer or a welder or a machinist. So, yeah. Then your hunting will stay fun. Then you'll still and that, exactly, hunting. exactly. It's very <laughs> difficult to keep hunting fun, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've had this conversation with numerous people that have been in the industry for a, a, a quite a long period of time. That that they've said exactly that. It's it's very difficult to keep it fun long term and and get in. So there's there's ways to do it. You just got to make sure you keep it right for yeah. true to true to you. You know. I mean, I mean, I know you've run into a lot, just like me, but I've run into a lot of people that are professional hunters and hunted with them over the years. And you see a lot of people that when the camera's not running, they're angry people. They're mad about everything that goes wrong. They're screaming about a missed shot. They're, you, you know, they're yelling at their groups and stuff. Like, How could you miss? And, you, you know, and there's just so much tension in the hunt instead of the enjoyment of the chase. You know, that yeah. it's, like they lose the whole reason that they got into it in the first place. Yeah. And, and, and they you, don't, if you don't do it as a job, you don't ever have that stress or that weight on your shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't think they mean to, it's just the pressure to succeed. And then, and then, right. the, and then if it's, you know, if the person isn't set right and they've created this facade of, you know, whatever world's best hunter or whatever and then it's like well, that's a monster because now you got to keep that engine going and that's the image you created but it's really just a falsified false per, per, you know perception right. and and that's what you created and and uh, sadly if that's who you are that's 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 a dead end road in the long you know i mean there's no way around it you can only keep that up for yeah. so long and then, and then it begins and i think it and a lot of people, it just develops over time, you know, and, and what you kind of hit on there, you know, with the, the sponsor thing. And, and I appreciate you sharing that because that's real, real, what, that's a real case scenario that you saw what you didn't like about that. And it's, it's like, uh, you know, it didn't, didn't suit you, but that's, that's a lot of people can't stop that. And that's, it does take a lot of discipline and a lot of like, I'm just going to 